Hello everyone and welcome to Skyscaller. For the last few videos we have been discussing chemical reactions in the chromosphere. Today I wanted to extend the discussion and address the nature of the chemical elements in the solar atmosphere, namely in the chromosphere and corona. Hydrogen constitutes an appropriate building block for a star as it is the primary element in the universe. It is logical therefore to postulate that the other elements must then be produced from that hydrogen. Astronomers try to argue that the solar atmosphere tells us something about the composition of the sun itself, but such statements are unjustified. Only material above the photosphere can be analyzed. The chemical composition in the interior cannot be ascertained. Still, some claim that helioseismology can be used to give relative elemental distributions. Such statements are beyond the scope of what is achievable. That computer models work only provides evidence that an approach can give a solution, not that the solution is correct. Helioseismology can give us many answers, but not the relative elemental composition of the solar interior. In this video, we discuss the elements that make up the chromospheric spectrum. Let us return to our periodic table for a moment. You recall that the elements that produced emission lines in the chromosphere are in yellow. Note the importance of the rare earths and the fact that neither the halides nor the inert gases produce chromospheric emission lines. We also discussed helium and highlighted in these two videos that the only way to account for its emission lines in the standard model was to first invoke photoionization using photons arising from the corona. Such an idea is untenable because this mechanism should also be available to all other elements in the chromosphere. Why are we not photoionizing neon, argon, fluorine, chlorine for example? Clearly the idea that helium is being photoionized is illogical. Scientists should not rely on a fact that a random process can solely affect a single atom. Now let us consider the elements which give rise to the Fraunhofer lines on the Sun. We can begin with this 1966 monograph from the NIST. A total of 61 elements are listed in the Fraunhofer spectrum in this work and they are now highlighted in the red box. However, if one examines the more recent spectrum available through the Paris Observatory, then only 53 elements are presented. You will read online that 67 elements have been identified in the Fraunhofer spectrum. However, I was not able to locate any supporting citations. Such a number is clearly in disagreement with the 53 elements found in the spectrum presented by the French Observatory. In any case, you will notice that the halides and the inert gases are not participating in producing Fraunhofer lines. The Fraunhofer lines are important because they are used to ascertain the relative abundance of the elements in the solar atmosphere as you can learn in this paper. But how do we determine the concentration of ideal gases, the halides and the other elements whose presence is difficult or impossible to ascertain in the solar atmosphere? This is where it gets interesting. For fluorine and chlorine, the relative abundances are derived by looking at hydrogen fluoride and hydrogen chloride concentrations in sunspots. What does this have to do with atomic fluorine and chlorine levels in the solar atmosphere? Probably nothing. It is likely that the halides and the ideal gases are not being seen in chromospheric and Fraunhofer lines because they are being coordinated with hydrogen and hydrogen clusters as the presence of hydrogen fluoride and hydrogen chloride in sunspots suggests. At the same time, we can observe chlorine, neon and argon in the ultraviolet. For instance, the elements shaded with a blue background are seen in the ultraviolet spectrum on the disk. I provide two references. Chromium is not reported in the second, but is found in the first with the exception of carbon which has only been seen on the disk and now placed in green. Most of these blue shaded elements have also been seen in the corona as you can learn in this paper. We now also place helium in gray because it is not seen in the corona but rather on the disk in prominences and in flares. In addition we can add titanium and cobalt in red. 
over the frequency range examined in the ultraviolet. Those two elements are only seen in the corona and not on the disc. It is also interesting to note that chromospheric lines appear relatively stationary while the UV lines in the transition regions experience red shifts indicating that the atoms are moving towards the sun as they emit, as you can learn here. Conversely, coronal emission lines tend to be slightly blue shifted, moving away from the photosphere. Finally, here is a figure of the elements found in the solar wind. In this figure, elements with higher atomic weights are being preferentially analyzed. Hydrogen and helium are also present, but not shown in the figure. We can highlight the elements found in the solar wind with a star. Note how few elements are present. You might also be interested in the infrared spectrum of the sun. Many molecules give lines in such spectra, and the atomic lines are dominated by species already observed in the Fraunhofer spectrum. Given all of this, how do the astronomers set the relative abundances in the sun? First, they try to identify all the Fraunhofer lines. They then examine the relative abundances of the elements in meteorites known as the carbonaceous chondrites. It was suggested in 1937 in this paper that the relative abundances from the chondrites could be linked to the relative photospheric abundances. The claim, again, is simply unreasonable. There is no solid argument for this conclusion. But still, the astronomers have worked hard to get the solar abundances in the sun to agree with the values in the chondrites. They have selected some lines, discarded others, adjusted abundances with complex models relative to elevations, and played with oscillator strengths of transitions. Now they have a nearly perfect agreement with the chondrite data. This just goes to show that if scientists can play with enough of the numbers, they can generate almost anything. As a result, think carefully before you accept the value of solar abundances for any given element. We simply will never know. There are processes occurring in the solar atmosphere and the interior which govern which elements are visible and which are not. Lithium, for instance, has been hypothesized by Ashcroft to stabilize metallic hydrogen. That might be why the lines are so weak in the solar atmosphere, as I have discussed in this paper. Other elements may also be involved in reactions and coordination products which will never be understood. All we can say is that hydrogen is the principal element in the nebula, and that it is likely that all stars start from there. The stars make all the other elements. The same applies to our own sun. If you enjoyed the video today, promote the channel, mention the video to your local astronomy club, support me with a like, and subscribe for more videos as we look more closely at the sun, the stars, and beyond. Comments are always welcome down below, and I'll see you soon on our next video.